Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one Ritzel at a time, back with the one and only and amazing Anna Kelly. Hi, Anna. Hi, Michael. Good to be here today. Awesome. Hey, I just want to hurt. I want to share with you a quote that I, I got actually in several comments over the last couple of weeks and kind of similar to episode number one, but it's I'm going to be more succinct. I think there's more and more people talking about rates going higher. And now there's just more and more belief that interest rates will be 10% and then it's impossible to get deals done. And that annoys me, right? <laughs> I think both you and I know that 10% cost of capital, even if it's here, even if it was 20% cost of capital, that's just one variable on a spreadsheet. And as investors, or at least for me, I won't use your words. I don't care what the cost of capital is because it's cost capital for everyone. And then I just put it in and I do, do the math. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So what do you think? 10% is possible. We should just pick up our toys and go home. Absolutely not. You know, as real estate investors, I can tell you this, and I think most of our listeners hopefully understand this, but for many, many investors, especially in the single home space, investors have been doing deals without their own money for a very long time. Many have not had the credit worthiness and the amount of capital to even get a bank loan on a 20 year amortization at five or 6%. So, what do they do? They go to private money and hard money. Private and hard money has been 10 to 16% since as long as I've known about it, which was about 2012, right? Well, and what so, was the most expensive hard or private money you actually personally ever have gotten? 12% with two points. Yeah, me too. 12 with two. Yep. Which I thought was crazy. But here's the thing. If you're just thinking of a rate and you go, that's four times what I could have gotten on my primary home two years ago or a year ago, right? You're going to say that's absolutely nuts. But the reality is if I were flipping a house and I'm not recommending flipping right now, unless you're really good and you've already had experience doing it. But if you're flipping a house, what do we do? We go get private money for the whole purchase price, oftentimes much of the rehab costs, and we force the value. We force that appreciation. Then we go refi it at a lower rate. And if we're going to keep it as a rental or we sell it, right? So investors have been doing deals at 10 to 12 easily, 16% in some markets for certain deals for a very long time and can still figure out how to make a deal work. The other pieces, and I alluded to this in video number two, if you want to go back and look at this, but if you're only thinking about interest rate, you know, to your point on the spreadsheet, you're going to go, that doesn't make sense. So what happens is you have to look at your total return, not just your cash on cash return. And this is really important and say, how am I making returns on this real estate deal? And for me, I look at real estate as an ideal investment. I for income, D for depreciation, tax benefits, E for equity, mortgage pay down, A for appreciation, which can be forced through a flip, forced through a multifamily or natural appreciation, and L my leverage. Leverage isn't just the rate that you're getting the deal done at. It's how you structure that loan, right? If I have an interest-only payment at 10%, that could be better than a fully amortized payment at 7%, depending on the deal and how I want to structure it. I may say annual payments instead of every month. I may balloon it in 10 years instead of having to refi in a year, right? But I look at every single one of those letters, those acronyms, and it's say, how can I make this a good deal? Not just what's the rate and what's my cash on cash return at this price, but how can I make this deal that doesn't look great at 10% into a deal by maximizing one or five of those letters? How can I juice the income? Well, if I can't do it with rate, maybe I can do it with terms. Maybe I can do it with lower down payment, right? So if I can get into deal with less of my own money, even at a 10% rate, I can have almost an infinite return on my money. If I'm borrowing, you know, doing a creative finance deal and only putting five or $10,000 down on a several hundred thousand dollar deal, I could have a 30, 40, 50% return on my own cash, even at 10% interest. So ask yourself with every deal, and I do this all the time. I look at the income, the cash on cash return. How can I modify the, the, the loan to give me the best leverage to maximize returns? Can I force appreciation? How much can I pay down equity, right? How can I structure that deal to pay down more? And then what are my tax benefits? Sometimes I've bought deals that don't have much in terms of income, but they are incredible tax benefits and have huge upside and appreciation. That can be just as good of a deal. And again, I don't care the cost of the capital on that thing. So my recommendation is don't ever say, I can't do deals at 10%. Say, how can I make this a deal? 
And if you've gone through all those check boxes and it's still not a deal, then you just pass on the deal and you look for the next one. But the deals are out there and you can make money in absolutely every single market cycle. Yeah, I again, I think I said this in video one, I'm starting to vibrate with excitement because again, I see people retreating. I see people giving up. I see people not doing the work. I see people not joining communities like ours who reward and encourage, right? One of the things I've tried to get on the last six months, I have some mindset folks. Um, you really got to get build a callus because there's so much fear right in front of us. And I have a saying, yeah. every time I see a crash video, I go, there goes 2% of my competition. And it is starting mm -hmm. to compound. And I just see more and more people pulling back, which I'm excited about. But as somebody that's trying to change lives, I need to. I, people need to see that there's still opportunity. 10% cost of capital hurts owner occupants the most. It crushes first time home buyers. I'm not lost on that. Right. But it helps investors because again, competition yes. recedes. It's just a fact. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's a reality. Right. And when there's less competition and then there's more fear, I can get properties, you know, for 30, 30% less than list. I can get 32% cash on cash return in six months. It's just there because I do the work in the last 13 months. I didn't get anything. I haven't gotten a deal on the MLS in over three years. I wow. got the one I just got was on the MLS. Anybody could have written an offer on it. Just consistency and daily focus. So uh, I don't really care about the cost of capital. It's just one variable. Yeah. The other thing that I'll just end on here in terms of cost of capital is, you know, it, it is always good if you can't do a deal and you don't have enough money to do the deal to think about partnerships, right? But partners usually want 30, 40, 50, 70% of the deal if they're going to put the cash up. So you borrowing at 10 is significantly less expensive for you than bringing on a partner who's going to want a lot bigger percentage of that income. And so don't think of 10 when you compare it to three a year ago. Compare 10 to giving up 50% of the deal, right? 10% is pretty darn cheap historically. Absolutely. Anna, where can people find you? Great. You can follow me every week here on your playlist, on your channel. You can follow me on social media at Anna Kelly, REI Mom. And for coaching and masterminds, you can find me at reimom.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.